Well, we're in the book of Job, and uh, we're in the second session, and we're going to springboard off chapter 2 and see if we can't get uh, all the way to chapter 5. Last, uh, in our introductory session, we talked about the basic book, the oldest one of the, clearly the oldest book in the Bible. It's one that's widely misunderstood, and uh, we'll try to glean from it the real lessons that God has for us here. In chapter 1, we saw an, uh, it opened up with Job and his prosperity. Here's a guy that was probably, we're dealing with the time of Abraham roughly, and probably in the area of northwestern Arabia, Edom, and that, that part of the world. Job is, we saw him in his prosperity, very wealthy, very powerful man. But we also saw this strange confrontation between God and Satan. Where God says, Satan, have you looked at my servant Job? And he says, because he's, and God gives him a, 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 an A on his report card. He's, uh, he's blameless. That doesn't mean sin, sinless, but he deals with a sin. In other words, he's right with God. Satan, in fact, says, well, of course he is. He's so prosperous. Take, that, take away his possessions, and of course he'll have a whole different attitude. So God says, okay, you can do that. And so Satan does. And the greatest calamities fall upon Job. He loses his, his kids. He loses his wealth. And, and uh, it's a very, very disturbing thing. Now, as we go through the book of Job, let's remember that Job didn't have the benefit of that conversation that we understand from reading chapter 1. All he knows is that the house came down, so to speak. Literally on his kids, killed them all. All ten of them, seven sons and three daughters. We also notice, a, we learn a lot about Satan in, in chapter 1. Satan's accountable to God. Let's remember that. It's not a dualism. He is subject to and accountable to the guy that created him. And his dark mind is an open book to God. And uh, Satan, we also learn, is behind the evils that curse the earth. And he's neither omnipresent nor omniscient. He's just a super angel. That's not the same. Don't, don't confuse him with a divinity. And in fact, Satan can do nothing without divine uh, authorization. But we also learn that God's eyes are always on his own. And that's, a, that's an exciting thing. And a little grandchild asked her grandpa, can God see me all the time? A little worried, you know. And grandpa says, he loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. I like that. And that's true of you and I. In any case, that's the quick background. But Satan was allowed to take away all his possessions but not touch him personally. And that brings us to chapter 2. Let's jump in Job chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God, that's this term for angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. That term, B'nai Elohim, it's a term used of angels. A lot of people don't really understand that, but it's very, very true, very well authenticated, both in the Old Testament, in the ancient rabbinical lecture, uh, literature, and also in the early church. So while there's some controversies about it, uh, I think it's they're, they're not within, not, not, not competently, okay. But now we're about to have round two, as we'll see. See, God has already vindicated uh, Job, and his, I should say his evaluation of Job in chapter one, but we've got round two coming up here. Verse two, the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So rhetorically, these two verses are very parallel to the two verses we encountered in chapter 1 that we're going to move on a little bit here. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? That's quite a statement. A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So in other words, uh, uh, he gives Satan the same challenge. But adds the fact that, uh, you know, in round one, he, Satan lost. <laughs> Job acquitted himself very honorably. And he's just beginning, by the way. So the chapter one is a rebuttal against the premise of Satan that all, this whole idea that all mankind is interested in is his own self-interest. That may be true for many, but not of Job. By the way, notice Satan's role is always accusing the brethren. So, you know, this, he's really our accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. And uh, we know that what that agenda, that's it. When we, there, there are a lot of um, people who have a ministry that starts getting obsessed with accusing the brethren. Newsletters, radio programs, whatever. 
And it's tragic because once you start down that path, it spirals and gets worse and worse and worse. And uh, we need to recognize whose agenda they're advancing. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan. And so uh, not that there aren't valid criticisms within the body, but they'd be dealt with in private. Uh, I, I, I'll check their Bible. I think it's still in Matthew 18. It's right in there. I'll take a look. But anyway, let's move on. Verse 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath he will give for his life. Skin for skin. That's a strange phrase. I think we get the flavor of it, though. It's a proverbial uh, saying, as if bartering for an animal. Skin for skin. What Satan's saying is, is you, 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 just, you didn't let me really touch him. You just let me touch his possessions. Possessions, his family. <laughs> And all the thousands of camel, all his, 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 his herds, it was enormous. But still, uh, uh, Satan challenges God. He says, uh, put forth thy hand now and touch his bone and flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. That's Satan's prediction. See, Satan's asking for a change of rules. He's lost round one. Now he wants the rules changed. I'm somehow reminded of something my dad told me. Never waste your time on a good loser, you know. <laughs> so we'll see what goes on here. Anyway. A flesh and bone, you see, that, that, what he's that phrase, of course, refers to our humanity. It's emotional as well as physical, by the way. But it's interesting that this is the same expression Jesus used after his resurrection. Remember that night in the upper room in Luke 24? Uh, handle me and see. They thought he saw it was a ghost. No, handle me and see. A spirit does not have what? Flesh and bone. Not flesh and blood, flesh and bone. The blood didn't shed. Flesh and bone. Um, now, as we go through this, realize, of course, that uh, as uh, Job has no awareness of this, uh, of, of uh, what was going on behind the scenes with Satan. And by the way, remember that. Remember that. Because you don't have any knowledge either what's going on behind the scenes. Job's going to get clobbered. He's been clobbered. He's going to get worse. And most of the book are dialogues about that we're going to get into. But remember that we have the benefit as observers of an insight Job didn't have. He had to just trust God. And he does. Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. In other words, you can do everything but kill him. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord, smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. The commentaries are full of conjectures as to what it was that he really had. Some say a form of leprosy. Some say an elephantiasis, whatever that is. And uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, about seven or eight other conjectures that I can't pronounce properly, so I'll spare you that. Sore boils is the way it's translated. They're very similar to the plagues in Egypt in Exodus 9, uh, also in Deuteronomy 28. Hezekiah had some kind of illness similar to this apparently in 2 Kings 20, but nothing like Job's because if you go through the book of Job's and extract all the allusions to his illness, you get quite a list. Because in verse 7, he's going to end up with inflamed ulcerous sores. In verse 8, they're itching. Uh, in um, verse 7 and 12, they're degenerative cha uh, changes in his facial skin. He has a loss of appetite in chapter 3. He has depression, nightmares, worms and boils. Hardened skin and running sores in chapter 7. Difficulty in breathing, chapter 9. Dark eyelids, failing vision. Foul breath, rotting teeth, loss of weight, anorexia, continual pain, restlessness, peeling, blackened skin, fever. And this all lasted for at least several months. And uh, all the lists and the references will be in the notes, but you get the idea. So you thought you had problems? <laughs> By the way, the good news is Satan does not appear after this verse. And we're through with him now. We've got the context set. From now on, we're going to focus on some of these issues. Verse 8 and 9, he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all. He sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Husbands do often draw emotional strength from their wives, in fact, more than they probably realize. So this is would seem on the face of it disheartening, but it must be admitted in the translation, we can't really tell what she's proposing and even less what her motive was. In the Septuagint, there's an expansion which represents her not unfavorably as sharing Job's misery so that her motive in wishing him dead was to end his unendurable suffering speedily. In other words, it was almost a, a, a comet of mercy, not, not, not 
Not the way it comes across in the translation to us. It actually, the word is actually blessed, but it's done with sarcasm. <laughs> so curse God and die is the way you find it in the English, but it may not be quite as brutal as it first sounds. There's, there's more to it than that. But verse 10, but he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil? See, in all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now, that's pretty impressive already. I know I wouldn't have handled it that way, you know. And by the way, he didn't call her a foolish woman. He said he spoke as one of the foolish women. So, again, the tension may not be as big as it sounds at first. See, Job's saying, we're not here to have a good time. There are meaningful objectives to be attained in this life, even when it all seems to turn sour. When pressure comes... When life is no longer fun, life is still worth living, is his, is his point. A philosophy that wants to abandon everything as soon as things become unpleasant is a shallow, distorted view of life. Now, Job did not sin. So the score now is two to zero in favor of Job and God against Satan. Okay? See, if Satan had his way, we would all perish. But God said you couldn't take his life. Well, he, did, he brought him right up to the edge. Huh? And we always want to remember that God assures us that we'll never experience more than we can handle. And Job proved that. And he's teaching us our limits. You say, well, gee, Satan really had Adam. He wiped out his flocks and his herds. He wiped out his family, all his possessions. Now he's taken away his health. Remember in Wall Street, they say, if the biggest problem is money, you're in good shape. Because, you know, you can always get more money. Health is a scary thing to lose, as you probably, I'm sure you're all sensitive to. But Satan's not through. He doesn't appear in the text, but in effect, there are three guys that show up that are the worst of all the things that happened to Job. These three guys are bad news. They're his friends. They are his friends. They come to mourn him. But as they often quip here, if you have friends like that, you don't need enemies. This is Satan's final stronghold, the spirit of Job, the ultimate reality of his life. Satan's heavy artillery in the book of Job are not the tornadoes and the brigands that stole his property. It's not the boil. His, his, his heavy artillery were his religious counselors. His religious counselors do more to jeopardize Job than all the rest put together. So let's pay attention to where this goes, okay? Verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came everyone from his own place. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. For they all had an appointment together to come to mourn for him and to comfort him. I want you to notice the kind of comfort they give him. But by the way, they all came from different countries, and they were his friends. Job was an international figure, very wealthy before he lost it at all. And they all came to, 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 uh, to help him, or moan him, comfort him. Eliphaz the Temanite. I'm going to suggest we're going to call him Eliphaz the Eloquent. I'm going to give each one of these guys a nickname to help you remember the style of their attitude. Eliphaz the Eloquent. Eliphaz is an Edomite name. We see him in Genesis 36. And uh, the Temanite was either from Tima in Arabia, some people conjecture, or Teman in Edom. That's the one I personally favor. And there's lots of scripture verses that, where these things are alluded to. But Eliphaz bases his arguments that he were going to, we're going to go through a whole bunch of discussion here, based on his own observation and human experience. That's Eliphaz's orientation. He really says Job is suffering because he has sinned. That's his premise. That's his assumption that undergirds his basic argument. That this is all the reason Job's in all this trouble. He obviously has some unconfessed sin in his life. Now, now around the office, we often joke about that. Someone will come, you know, have a, have a bad cold and can't keem to shake it for a few days. We say, there must be some unconfessed sin in your life. But we're being facetious, of course, just doing it, you know, just in banter. Well, we get to the second guy, Bildad the Brutal. 
Bill Dad the Shoe Eye. You know, they often, we often use that little contest, you know, uh, who's the shortest guy in the Bible? Most people say Nehemiah is the shortest guy in the Bible. If they ever say this, no, no, it's Bill Dad the Shoe Height. See? Okay. <laughs> it's amazing what you can learn in these Bible studies. Isn't it? <laughs> Bill Dad the Shoe Height was from Shua. It's a location probably named after Abraham's youngest son in Genesis 25. And there is a plausible identification with a place in the middle of Euphrates, uh, it's mentioned in cuneiform text, but those are conjectures. No one's really, no, of these locations and stuff, are, there are a lot of scholastic conjectures. Some, it's all su uh, suggestive evidence, not, nothing certain about that. But anyway, Bildad, the brutal as I'll call him, he rests his arguments on human tradition. He simply says that Job's a hypocrite. That's what he'll say when we get to him. And the third guy is Zophar the Zealous. <laughs> And um, he has the same. His name is the same as Balak's father. There may be a relationship in Numbers twenty-two or not. We're not sure. Can name him possibly as a town in Judea, but we're not sure. But so far, the zealous. His arguments are based on the assumptions of human merit versus orthodox dogma. He he said he simply says Job. <clears throat> pardon me. Job is a wicked man. All these reasonings are wrong in their conclusions and false in their logic. So God himself, by the way, is going to declare that they were that they had, quote, darkened counsel by words without knowledge when you get to chapter 38. Ultimately, after these discourses get thrashed around, God himself will go to def in the defense of, of uh, Job. So they're the three friends. I'm going to leave on the shelf for the moment a fourth guy that will show up by the name of Elihu. And he's a man of mystery. We'll talk about him when we get there, but just realize that there are three friends and Elihu. When God steps in to rebut these guys, he rebuts the three friends. He doesn't comment on Elihu. Elihu is, I think, widely misunderstood. Many commentators just assume, well, he's a fourth guy and he was wrong too. Well, maybe it's so. I think he's more of an intercessor than a judge and we'll take a look at him. And he'll show up in chapter 32. And uh, again, he's... Uh, a Buzzite, may have been from Buzz, which is a name of Abraham's nephew, uh, mentioned along with Dedan and Tima. Those are all Arabian locations, so we think we're pretty fits secure on the ge geographic assumptions here. But anyway, these three friends, when they had, verse 12, when they had lifted their eyes afar off, and they knew him not. In other words, they didn't recognize Job at first. They knew him not. They lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent everyone his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. These are all classic ways to express grief and despair. They wailed, emotional shock. They wept in sorrow. They tore their robes. It's very Jewish to tear your robes when, when you're in, in brokenheartedness. And they threw dust over their heads towards heaven is a way of expressing deep grief and their helplessness. And uh, so they handle the situation like a funeral. Job is almost there, in fact, wishes he was in a funeral before we're through. Verse 13, so they sat down with him upon the ground. How long? Seven days and nights. Wow, seven days and seven nights. And they, none spoke a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. That's actually pretty sensitive. It's amazing when someone has grief, how we want to call. Yeah, I can remember when my dad died. I was getting my mother just settled down, just beginning to deal with it, and someone would call and commiserate over the phone, and she'd get all broken up again after working. I mean, if they just would leave us alone for a few days, not you know, you, you feel you have to do something. And it's amazing. That it's, uh, solitude is, 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 in many respects, often the best healer. But anyway, seven days was the statutory term for mourning the dead, by the way. We see that in Genesis 50, 1 Samuel 31, Ezekiel 3, and other places. Which means we got through a full chapter. That's pretty good. We're doing fine. Here's Job chapter 3. And after this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. His, when he says his day, it probably means his birthday, the day of his birth. Weeks may have gone by, apparently. And he's baffled. He's buffeted, tormented. Job longs for death. In this chapter, he's going to ask three poignant questions. First is, why was I ever born. I don't know how many of you ever felt have been that low, that low, but I think many of us have gone through a period where we really, you know, in our heart of hearts, raise that question. Verse 2, Job spake 
and said, or actually the Hebrew says answered, let the day perish when I was born and the night in which it was said, this is a man child conceived. And by the way, there's a, there are other Psalms of grief that are analogous to Job 3 here in Jeremiah 20 and Lamentations 3, but especially Psalm 22 verse 1. There was one that bellowed out like this, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, Jesus quotes that in Matthew 27. Anyway, verse 4. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Let not the light shine upon it. Just to give you a flavor, we're, we're just getting, a, 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 and the translations are not easy, by the way. Almost every major author has, does his own translation because the Hebrew is very difficult. But it is incredibly eloquent. There's darkness is going to be mentioned the next five times using four different words. And the verbal tapestry here is clearer in the Hebrew, of course, in all six lines of verses four and five. They're unified by various verbal signals. Verse five, let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify or stain or challenge it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined into the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of months or let, or let it not rejoice among the days. Another way to say it. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it, that curse the day who are ready to raise up their mourning, it may say in your translation. It actually, is raise up their Leviathan. The word Leviathan is mentioned in five passages in the scripture. Here in chapter 41, where we will take it up and talk about it. Psalm 74, Psalm 104, and Isaiah 27. These are possible reference to dinosaurs. And we'll take that up as a topic when we get to chapter 41. Job is probably simply referring to the custom of sorcerers or enchanters who claim to have power to make a day unfortunate by rousing the dragon asleep in the sea. It's poetic license on a common idiom is what we're dealing with here. Remember, the book of Job is mostly like an opera. It has a front end and a back end that's prose. But most of the, you'll, you'll discover as we get into this, the actual rhetoric that's recorded with these discourses is incredibly eloquent. And uh, it's, it's uh, in, almost in the end of itself in terms of the eloquence with which it's expressed. Continuing at verse 9, Job says, Let the stars of the twilight therefore be dark. Let it look for light but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day. And I like the way the Hebrew says it, the eyelids of the morning. <laughs> the eyelids of the... <laughs> that's great. Verse 10, because it shut up not the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. This is marvelous poetry, Hebrew poetry, of course. And Job's pressure, of course, is increasing, and he's beginning to crumble under it. And uh, there's nothing harder for us to understand than unexplained trouble. It's different if you know why it happened, if it causes it. When it's just surrounding you for no apparent reason, that's the, that's the hardest to deal with. Verse 11, Job continues, Why died I not from the, the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? See, the second question, why, why was I born then? Why didn't I die at birth? He's, he's low. He's, he's really down, understandably. Verse why did the knees prevent me? Why did the breasts should I, that, that I should suck? He's saying, he said, my, wife, my life has been totally meaningless. But then he gives us a very primitive view of death that he'll revise before this book is over. Uh, verse 13, For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then I had been at rest. With kings and councils of the earth, which built desolate places for themselves, or with princes that had gold who filled their house with silver, or as a, a, a hidden untimely birth, I had not been as infants which never saw the light. There were wicked, there uh, the wicked ceased from troubling, and the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. That's his concept of death. He could be at least at rest in solitude. That's what he's yearning for. Many people see death that way, time of rest, so on. Now, there's a play called Our Town. Many of us got involved with it in high school, which uh, deals with that sort of a perspective. Now, Job's understanding of life after death is going to need enlightenment, and he gets it before this book is over. In fact, in chapter 19 is one of the most incredible declarations of the resurrection that you'll find in the Old Testament when we get there. 
In fact, this may be one of the reasons that suffering comes into his life because it really sharpens his understanding of what life is really all about. His view of death, Job's view of death, will be very different by the end of the book. Well, now we get to Job's third question is, why can't I die now? So, you know, why was I born? Why didn't I die at birth? Well, why can't I die now? He's, re he is, he's really down. That's really what it boils down to. Verse 20, wherefore is light given to him that is in misery and life unto the bitter in the soul which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures. Suicide is never contemplated here. Death must be, must be God's gift. And for Job now, this is the only possible um, evidence of God's goodness. If you just take me out of here. That's Job's mindset. That's his attitude. That means he's going to kill, kill himself. That's not, that's not in view here. It's just an expression of how desperate he is, how, how uh, troubled he is. Verse 22. Which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? For my sign cometh before I eat and my roarings are poured out like the waters. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. So that's, jo that's uh, Job's declaration of how extremely uh, troubled he is. Now come his three counselors, Eliphaz the eloquent, Bildad the brutal, and Zophar the zealous. Eliphaz is the oldest, and there's a smoothness about him, there's a, uh, and a courtesy, at least at the beginning, that indicates he's learned how to be diplomatic, how to say unpleasant thing in gracious ways. Bildad is brutal and outspoken. He's going to lay it on Job and he doesn't care what the effect is. That's why I call him Bildad the brutal. I use that, that thing just to help you remember which is which. And Zophar is compassionate and emotional, but he speaks with a great deal of force trying to motivate Job. Now these, these are oversimplifications. All these characters are too human to be stereotypes or caricatures. There's not some mystical structure here. These very much take the, char the character of being real people. But our own philosophies will be echoed in their arguments. And there are at least 18 speeches on this, what I'll call a wisdom school on a dunghill. Because <laughs> there they are. They're going to have this eloquent philosophical discussion. There's going to be 10 different speeches by Job, three by Eliphaz, three by Bildad, and two by Zophar. And it's not quite that simple, but that's just to give you a rough perspective that you can break it down a few other, other ways. What's going to make these discussions so provocative is it's hard to find any proposition in the book which is not, in some sense, correct. Taken in isolation. This is going to be a marvelous example of things that are really true in general, but not here. How important it's going to teach us how important it is to apply it to the, uh, to the right fact situation. There's not going to be any meeting of the mind in this clash of words that we're going to encounter. Job is not arguing a point. He's trying to understand his experience. There's a big difference. Big difference. He's dreadfully in earnest, and yet he's also very transparently honest. Job acquits himself quite well here. His friends will talk about God, but Job talks to God. And uh, this makes him the only authentic theologian in the bunch. He tells God exactly how he feels and just what he thinks. And there can't be any prayers better than that. So Job's on track, even though as desperate as he is and so forth. By the way, nowhere does Job bewail the losses of chapter 1. He's reconciled to that. I don't know if I could be. He did. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. I mean, okay. There's no place that he bewails the uh, illness of chapter 2. He's upset about it, but he, he's in a sense reconciled. He's trying to understand why. His concern from beginning to end is with God. Not his health. I'm not his wealth or his health, chapter 1 chapter 2, but his life with God. It is because he seems to have lost God that he's in such torment. The real insight to Job's uh, anxiety is not the wealth, not the health problems, is that he, he fears that there's his relationship with God is severed, and he can't handle that. He can't handle that. Let's go up to Job. Chapters 4 and 5 
constitute Eliphaz's first discourse. We're not going <laughs> to relax. We're not going to go through all uh, 18 speeches in Job. It's a 42-chapter book. We're going to try to do it in, in, in a fewer number of sessions than that. Because for one, But once you will go through Eliphaz, you'll get the flavor that pretty much characterizes the others. And we'll talk about the others subsequently. But, but we'll go to this. We'll, we'll actually go read through chapter 4 and 5. And uh, uh, Eliphaz is going to put his address in four, chapters 4 and 5. He'll speak again in chapter 15 and chapter 22. But his first argument breaks down into six main points. And when you hear them, you'll get the gist of what all the others are going to be saying through the rest of the book. Eliphaz begins by saying to Job, in fact, he's going to say, follow your own advice. Verse 1 in chapter 4. Eliphaz, the Temanite, answered and said, now notice the way he does this. He's really got courtesy here. If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking or refrain from words? In other words, do you mind that we need to talk about this? See, he's, you sense at least an apparent courtesy up front. He gets tougher as it goes, but at least he's starting out courteously. Verse 3, Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have beholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it has come upon thee, and thou faintest. It toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and uprightness of thy ways? He's saying to Job, you've been a counselor to others. You, you, to many people, you, you've identified the problem, and you assist other people dealing with it. Now it's your turn. You need to follow your own advice. A pretty good opener, okay? But then he goes on to define the problem. And we learn Eliphaz has this basic principle of life. Verse 7. Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. See, Eliphaz's basic principle is you reap what you sow. That's certainly true in the general is it necessarily true here? You remember the psalmist said, Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and I've been old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. But you see, Eliphaz is going too far. Uh, That's one thing in an abstract principle. It's quite another to apply it to Job's case. Eliphaz deserves the retort by Job. Job should have said something like, you haven't seen much. He's relying, Eliphaz is relying on his own experience to generalize. Verse 9. By the bla- Eliphaz continues. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostril, the nostrils they are consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, the teeth of the young lions are broken, the old lion perishes for lack of prey, and the stout lion's whelps are scattered abroad. <laughs> well, what Eliphaz's argument lacks in substance he makes up for with rhetoric. <laughs> there are no fewer than five different words for lion in that verse. This is incredibly eloquent Hebrew that's going on here. Eliphaz uses a pride of lions or a family of lions to describe the, the natural strength of human beings. And it, it appears strong, but in God's judging hand, it's broken. See, the argument is that the righteous are never punished and only the unrighteous suffer. That's base, Eliphaz's basic premise. In fact, he says, where did you ever see an innocent man uh, perish? Where did you ever see an unrighteous man succeed? Is, is what's he, the question he's begging. And of course, uh, he, he concludes that Job's problem is caused by his own sin. Something he's hiding, something he isn't admitting. He said, in other words, Job, if you'll admit what's wrong with the sin, then everything's going to be all right. Well, that's a principle that needs to be re-examined. You remember in John 9, Jesus said, who, you know, they, or they asked Jesus, the disciples, the blind who sinned, this man or his parents? Remember? Well, it was in this case for, this, for the glory of God. But remember Moses in Midian? He was 40, 40 uh, years in Midian. Married to Ivan de Carlo all those years. You know? And uh, David in his hideout from Saul. Both Jeremiah and Joseph were in a pit. Did they deserve to be? Uh, Daniel was in the lion's den. Did, did he deserve to be? Was he there because he did something wrong? Hardly. He was there because he did something right. Paul was in prison more than once. Was it because he did something wrong? Was it sin that put him in that kind of a situation? Here's Job in the city dump, same situation. All the heroes of Hebrews 11, we go through what some people call the hall of faith. All, all those people with all the sawed in half and all, all those different things going on. What? Because they were wrong. It's because they were right. So there's, it's not that simple. And of course, the ultimate example 
is Jesus. Jesus was the innocent one to suffer for all of us. Anyway, Eliphaz goes on to tell, uh, tell Job that if he will fear God and confess his sins, everything's going to be all right. Eliphaz apparently recognized that relying on his own experiences, it makes him a little vulnerable. So now he's going to fall back on a claim of divine revelation. I have a prophecy. No, sir. Okay. Uh, it's going to be very similar to what happens to Balaam in Numbers uh, 24, but let's move on here. He's going to break down his message in two parts. And first, he, he, he's going to refer to a night vision that came to him. This is going to get kind of spooky here. So hang on. Verse 12 to 15 is, 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 is pretty spooky. Verse 12. Eliphaz, speaking to Job, Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof. In other words, by stealth in the Hebrew. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, and the hair of my flesh stood up. The word here is ruach, which also can mean wind, but it's very strange. It's usually in the feminine. Here it is used with masculine verbs. His stood, his appearance, so forth. Uh, it's, it, it's clear that what's intended to, to communicate is the Spirit of God, not just wind. By the way, the same thing happens in the Greek in Th Second Thessalonians with the restrainer. It's a neuter, and yet it's used in a, in a masculine way, and so forth. It's a hint that it's the Holy Spirit. But anyway, uh, that's what he's intending to communicate here. Verse 16, it stood still, and I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes, and there was silence, and I heard a voice saying. In fact, it says, I heard a still small voice. Verse 17, shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Now this banality, if you will, makes Eliphaz sound pretentious. And it's really quite unfair. Job hasn't questioned the ways of God. He hasn't claimed to be better than God. All he's done is proclaim his misery. But Eliphaz has taken this you know, in that direction. Verse 18, Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels. He charged with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundations in the dust which are crushed before the moth. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without regarding it. They actually destroy it. It's beaten in pieces, whatever he says. But anyway, doth not their excellency which is in them go away? They die even without wisdom. This whole argument is based on the fact that infinite justice rules the universe. You can't argue with that. God is holy and pure. Pure. So, and what chance would a man uh, who's to have to stand before him and claim to be uh, sinless? This is good theology, it would seem. Even Socrates understood this when he declared, perhaps deity can forgive sins, but I don't see how. That's a profound insight into the justice of God. And we're going to see before the end of this book that this was a problem that Job himself was indeed facing. He did not understand his own heart, and so he so confesses at the end. But the problem with Eliphaz's argument is that he sees God only as a God of justice. See, God is a God of justice. What he's saying is true, but it's only part of the story, only part of the fact. How often we come to an erroneous judgment, even in human affairs, when we only have half the facts. And... Uh, Eliphaz sees nothing of God's love, compassion, or forgiveness. He has no grasp of discipline or training from the Father's hand. It's a whole different concept. See, because he's got an unbalanced theology, that his truth becomes false in its application. You can take something that's true and misapply it is the point, how, how we need to understand that. See, this is why many people will take partial truths and end up in error. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon uh, spoke about preachers who went about with a theological revolver in their ecclesiastical trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Seliphaz continues to argue that uh, trouble comes only from, from sin. But the gulf between Job and his friends is beginning to open up. And uh, Job's position is, is more audacious, believing uh, uh, more, than, uh, 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 more believing in effect in God than Eliphaz's insipid insinuations. And he's, he's not going to be reminded, uh, excuse me, he's not going to be uh, silenced by reminders that it is not for a puny man to question the ways of Almighty. Job's questions may be unanswerable, but he will ask them and he will insist upon his right to ask them before it's over. Let's get through chapter 5, verse 1. Jo Eliphaz continues, Call now, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints will thou turn? 
For wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. See, that's what he's saying. In fact, uh, that's what's really what's wrong. You're vexed and, and jealous, and that's why you have trouble. Verse 3, Eliphaz says, I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. His children are far from safety, and they are crushed in the gate. Neither is there any to deliver them. Now, this is a nasty blow by Eliphaz. This is a hidden reference to the calamity that took place in chapter 1, when the roof fell down and killed all of Job's ten children, ten, seven sons and three daughters. Eliphaz is suggesting that these things, such things can only happen when uh, there's something wrong in Job's life. He's blaming Job for the killing of his children. You can imagine that Job's having a, getting a belly full of the comfort he's getting from Eliphaz. Huh? Verse 5. Continue, whose harvest the hungry eateth up and taketh it even out of thorns, and the robbers swallow up their substance. And although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground. Yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. And, or the uh, uh, Hebrews says, the sons of burning coal lift up the sky. Have you ever seen a fire? You've seen the sparks go up. Well, that's, he's saying that, the, that uh, uh, man is born to trouble just as the sparks fly upward. And trouble comes from sin, and if you've got trouble, sin has to be the reason. Stop and think. Do you see the logical error there? Trouble comes from sin. So if you have trouble, sin has to be the reason. Do you see the logical error? See? Trouble comes from sin, but trouble can come from lots of other places too. Follow me? So the fact you may have trouble doesn't... Sin could be one of the possibilities. There are others. But that's the logical, see, this is one of the more conspicuous logical fallacies here. Now, the next section, Eliphaz is going to make the point that there's no playing games with God because God knows too much. He's got all the facts. That's basically it here. So what he's going to say is true. He's just misapplying it. Verse 8, Eliphaz says, I would seek unto God and unto God would I commit my cause, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. Who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth waters upon the fields to set upon high those that be low, and that those that mourn should be exalted to safety. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of, his, of the forward is carried headlong. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope in the noonday as the night. And he saveth the poor from the sword and from the mouth and from the hand of the mighty, so that the poor hath hope. And iniquity stoppeth her mouth. This is one of the most beautiful creedal hymns in the Bible. It simply says God is in control. And that he's so clever and wise that you cannot deceive him. Just give up and, and get it out into the open and God will bless you. That's sort of the thrust of Eliphaz's argument here. Verse 17, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Well, boy, this all sounds familiar. We've, uh, Psalm 94, 12, Proverbs 3, 11, Hebrews 12, 5. That's going to be the point that Elihu makes when you get to Job 36, but that's, we get ahead of ourselves. But Eliphaz continues in verse 18. For he maketh sore, he bindeth up, he woundeth, his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven. Shall no evil touch thee. In famine he shall redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue, neither shalt thou be afraid of the destruction when it cometh. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh, neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. For thou shalt be in league with the, sto with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee. And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shall not sin. Well, anyway, in view of, <laughs> in view of Job's loss of property and family, uh, Eliphaz's bumbling... Uh, on here is, probably, is understandably infuriating Job. He's going to have his response in chapter 6 and 7. Verse 25. Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great, thy offering as the, uh, excuse me, offspring as the grass of the earth, and so on. You know, it's here, verse 25 is promising you the good news is he's going to have great seed. You know, this promise of numerous descendants can hardly comfort someone who has just been rendered childless. You t these guys are incredibly ins insensitive uh, to the situation Job's facing. Verse 26, Thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age like a shock of corn cometh in a season. Lo, this we have searched it, and so it is. Hear it, know it for, thou go for thy good. 
Dillich, one of the great commentators in the Old Testament, points out that, the, quote, the skill of the poet is proved by the difficulty which the expositor has in detecting that which is false in the speech of Eliphaz. In other words, you can go through his speech very carefully and you can't find a proposition that isn't really true, but it's just misapplied. It doesn't fit Job's situation. See, it's good theology, but it's not taking all the facts. And the Lord himself is going to single out Eliphaz in making this error when we get to chapter 42, which is the concluding chapter. Anyone that's been around a while can, knows that there's, it's possible to find godly people who have not been protected, who still will go through times of trial and peril and suffering. Job has no quarrel with the statements of, of highlighting the power and justice of God. This issue just doesn't fit his case. He has long ago learned that he has to view his good life not as a reward. And so he has, it's like a gift and a, uh, uh, not a reward. It's a gift, not a reward. So he has no complaint when it's removed. That's, that's been Job's attitude at the beginning, and he, he sustains that attitude. But Job's highest wis uh, 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 wisdom is to love God for God, for, for God alone. He loves God for himself alone, not because of what he gets out of it. And so Eliphaz's words are, rather than a comfort, they're really a trap. Job is being tested the same way Abraham was being tested in Genesis 22. And Abraham's testing, like Job's, was neither punitive, like for a sinner, nor is it, cor uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, or corrective for the saint. It's a different kind of a test. Do you trust me? Is what God is saying. And Abraham did. And Job, in his own way, will also. But no thanks to these characters that he's surrounded with. This story, I believe, in part, is given to us that we might learn to correct our theology and understand that there are deeper reasons for suffering than sin. Now, Job's speeches are going to face this reality far more courageously than those of his friends. The vindication of goodness, God's or man's, uh, lies beyond ultimate testing and death. When the victory of resurrection proves the indestructibility of the good life. And the best example is, is the cross. The darkest mystery of human agony will be embraced by God himself and be, be uh, transformed into, uh, from moral outrage into glory. When the victim is the willing sin bearer, his suffering becomes the conquest of evil and the display and proof that God is love. That suffering by God himself will be the ultimate display of love. That's really what it's all about. People often say, what's it all for? Why did God make man? He knew he was going to sin and so on and so forth. Ephesians 2, 7 is your answer to that. We always quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Even it, the faith, is a gift that no flesh should boast. It's the verse before that gives you the clue. Why does God do all this? so that in ages yet to come, he can manifest his glory in his, in, his, in his riches in Christ Jesus. It's God's incredible achievement. Well, anyway, Eliphaz's comfort that we've experienced in the last two chapters raises uh, Job's torment even a higher pitch. Job's loss of certainty about God's goodness is a poverty and a pain that's more desolating than any of his, or I should say all of his other troubles. All his poverty, all his pain is less than the, 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 his loss of certainty about God's goodness. See, everything else may go, but, uh, not, uh, but God has to remain. So it's this threat to his faith, not his running sores, that becomes the utmost hurt in his mind. The friendship of God is all that matters now. And that's going to, going to declare that in chapter 29 when we get there. Now, we've managed to get through um, <laughs> quite a handful here. Job's reply will come in chapter 6 and 7. He'll reply to all of this. In chapter 6, he's going to rebuke his friends, not just Eliphaz, all three of them. And chapter 7, he's going to address his complaint directly to God. 
And uh, so we're gonna, we'll, we'll see how far we can get through. We're not gonna go verse by verse through all the discourses, relax. I wanted to go through Eliphaz's because it's sort of foundational and it gives you a flavor of, of what's going on here. And we'll try to uh, uh, lay out the essence of the other uh, discourses and dialogues that are going on. But understand that Job's not trying to prove a point, he's trying to understand the experience. There's a big difference there There's a, 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 between the two. Now, not all of Job, well, it, I should say, uh, uh, there are some other discoveries that we're going to make as we go that uh, emerge in these discussions. There are more scientific comments in the book of Job than probably any other book in the Bible. There's more, uh, there are at least 15 specific anticipations of, of scientific breakthroughs that are alluded to here in Job. We're going to discover that there are more comments on creation in the book of Job than anywhere else in the Bible. We're also going to notice in all of these things there are no fallacies, no errors. We'll talk a little bit about that before we're all through. So the book of Job. Superficially, people say, well, it's, the book of Job is all about why do the innocent suffer? No, uh-uh. That is an issue, but it's not the primary issue. And it's that God is in control, and there's a handful of other lessons. We, we highlighted some of those in our first session. And we'll, we'll recommit uh, those as we go through. Book of Job. What you might do for next time is read ahead. Read chapters 6 and 7 for sure. And, 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 and uh, in, in theory, at least, we, in the next couple of sessions, we'll want to go all the way through to chapter 31. 32 is a change of scene. And what happens subsequently will be different. But the next, uh, the, the next uh, couple of dozen chapters are discourses between these guys. Uh, making a statement to Job and Job replying. You can skim through that for next time if you can. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Anytime you think you've got problems, it's worthwhile jumping in at least the first few chapters of the book of Job because uh, there is a, there's an incredible, there's incredible uh, issues there, but there's also some astonishing encouragement forthcoming. We'll be well rewarded for our diligence to hang in there through this book. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for Job. We thank you for its lessons, Father. We thank you for highlighting to us that there's the major parts of the combat are behind the scenes that we're not aware of, that we don't see, that we are, in effect, in a sense, pawns in a cosmic war. But we're also the prize. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen to single us out. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us. We thank you, Father, that you're ever there to guard, shield, protect, and encourage. And we thank you, Father, that you've promised that we will not be tested above that we were able. So we just thank you, Father. And we, we do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate these many lessons in this book, that we would be more sensitive to the fact that, that uh, our job is simply to believe in and trust you, Father, and all the rest will follow. We thank you for Job and his example, and we thank you for this book, which will illuminate how truths can be misapplied. Help us, Father, not to take a, a basic principle and misapply it in situations where you don't have all the facts, Father. Help us, Father, to, for dis, with, with discernment that in all these things we might be more effective stewards of your Many gifts, Father. We pray, Father, that you'd help each of us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, in whose name we do pray. Amen.